Okay. So, um, hello everybody. Um, on behalf of Women in Geospatial, I'm welcoming everybody to this uh, networking session uh, that is um, going to, to start with a panel. We have four panelists, um, wonderful ladies. We have Maria Brovelli from the Politecnico of Milano. We have Miriam from UP42, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have uh, also Natalie Sidibe from um, OSM Mali, and we also have Danielle Groningen from uh, University of Hans uh, Alabama in Huntsville and NASA uh, Impact. So, um, without further ado, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this session itself. Um, we're going to have this panel session for one hour right now, and then we're going to head over work adventure for a more interactive chat. Um, and uh, basically, we're going to have some interaction with uh, the, the uh, you ladies, uh, the ones that want to um, want to participate. And then we are going to have some free chat as well uh, going from uh, our session on Monday which was also about networking and careers. Um, so yes, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my speakers and I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves uh, just as a uh, heads up of their career. So uh, let's start with uh, clockwise. Let's start with Maria. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Christina. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Maria Brovelli. I'm from Italy, specifically from uh, Como, which is a city close to Milan. And I'm professor of geographic information systems. Uh, with respect to my career, I studied before physics and specifically environmental physics. But then during my uh, thesis, I had the opportunity of working with people uh, here at engineering, where I'm now working. And uh, I started working on geodesy, as a matter of fact. Uh, then at a certain point, I was told that the only opportunity for uh, a position here was to start teaching something absolutely new that was GIS. This was then 1992, many years ago, because I'm old. And I say, why not? I will start studying this GIS. And so I started uh, teaching GIS. And then uh, since then, I always worked on GIS. OK, this is, in short, my life. We're going to expand on that anyway. So <laughs> um, I'm just going to let Miriam introduce herself as well. OK, perfect. Should I do like Maria or just uh, like a short and then we can go to the questions? I, I got a bit confused, uh, Christina. Uh, just uh, a short introduction of yourself, of what you're doing, and then we're going to go into geospatial and open geospatial. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Miriam Gonzalez. Uh, right now I'm doing partnerships for Off42. It's a startup in geospatial. Uh, I'm volunteer in different organizations. I am part of the board in humanitarian open street map. And also I am an observation evangelist for the fire uh, initiative. Uh, that's the uh, something for supporting the green European deal and having air observations uh, supporting I mean, all the goals. And also I'm co-founder of Geochicas. So uh, happy to be here with you guys. Happy that you uh, honored our invitation as well. Um, I'm going to let Danielle also introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Grunin, and I currently live in Huntsville, Alabama in the United States. I'm a research scientist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville um, working on a NASA impact project. My background is in also in physics, like Maria. Um, I chose to then go pursue atmospheric science meteorology as my master's, my PhD. In between that, I was a high school physics teacher for three years. So I'm really into um, science communication and outreach really because of that. Right now I'm working on really NASA Earth data projects. So. I am working more as a data scientist now and working on data stewardship, metadata curation for projects like um, involving airborne and field campaign data for NASA, and then a, a joint ESA NASA project called MAP, which is um, related to biomass mapping. Thank you. Very happy to be here too. 
very happy to have you here as well. And uh, that's a very, um, we're starting to have a very diverse background here in the panel. So let's hear from Natalie as well. And uh, then we're gonna, um, we're gonna go to, to learn more about your geospatial career. Okay, thank you, Christina. And hi, everyone. I'm Natalie Sidive from Mali. I'm based in Bamako, the capital city of Mali. Uh, um, I got involved in OpenStreetMap uh, uh, since uh, 2014, and um, uh, I've been leading the, the OpenStreetMap community in Mali. Uh, also, I've been volunteering with Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And I'm currently uh, leading uh, Open Cities project in Mali with Humanitarian Open Street Map Team and the World Bank. Um, thank you, Natalie. I think we uh, kind of lost you a bit. Um, thank you, Natalie. Uh, we, we see that you have all diverse backgrounds and uh, I think our audience would like to know a little bit more what got you into geospatial because uh, Maria, you already touched some, some of those points, uh, but um, many of us started from a different background uh, or um, got into geospatial in a, um, by chance or uh, by luck or anything. So we would like to know um, yeah, that has a, a good career in geospatial. How did you get yeah. it? Um, I, I'm um, human resource manager. Yeah, I studied human resource manager ma management here, and uh, I, I learned about OpenStreetMap in 2014 in Mali. So um, I've been trained, and then I um, yeah I decided to. To, to do, uh, yeah, to work, uh, to be involved in OpenStreetMap and to do only OpenStreetMap, only uh, promoting geospatial data in Mali. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here by, by chance, I can say, but I'm very lucky, I'm very lucky because uh, since I'm, uh, I get involved in this, in this field, all my life have been changed. So, <laughs> so I learned I learn a, a lot in OpenStreetMap team uh, and in OpenStreetMap and all my life changed because of OpenStreetMap. So all I have now is because of OpenStreetMap. Yeah. That's a and I, I, continue, I continue yeah I continue to, to learn I continue to learn because I um, I, I know what um what impact I'm I'm doing uh in my country and uh in also in west africa uh so it's uh <laughs> i'm very lucky i'm very lucky that's a very fortunate that's a very fortunate uh, uh, like of uh, like of, uh, uh just and you and you provide some impact to your country and uh, <laughs> that's something that drives us all <laughs> Yeah, um, kind of expand on that because she's also always because it's hot all the time. Uh, <laughs> sorry, can you come on again, please? I'm, I'm sorry because I'm, I'm French. I'm French speak. I'm, I'm Francophone, if I can say, yeah. So English is not my, my first <laughs> language. So I'm doing my best to understand, to, to, to talk with you. So. Sometimes I can I can not understand well what you you mean. So yeah, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, we're very happy to have everyone here, what their English level is. Uh, so uh, yeah, the the main uh, point is to, to learn from your experience and uh, maybe to learn about what drives you to persevere in this 
and considering that uh, we both work with Alcatraza, I would like to go uh, to Miriam and hear her experience. Um, I just wanted to to give like the the floor to you. Um, just to expand on what's your work, uh, what started you in geospatial as well. Now I'm muted, sorry. So, okay, now it's my turn. Uh, so, uh, it's, a, it's a funny story, I would say, because uh, I, I didn't study anything related to air observation or, or mapping, but I, I always like maps. Uh, I remember when I was little, I was collecting maps uh, when I was like 10 years old. And also, I just, I mean, I used to love to watch Carl Sagan uh, giving all these amazing uh, cosmos uh, TV shows and listening to him in Mexican and Spanish, it was fantastic. So I think, I mean, I, that's how I started like loving all, all science, but at the same time, I mean, life took me to international business because also I think around me there was kind of uh, not many opportunities in my hometown. I mean, I didn't see, I didn't speak with people in this major, so I decided to study international business. And then I was in different industries. And then I was taking one year off uh, living in Beijing, China, because I, I wanted to quit everything and um, be kind of a sabbatic year. So I came back to Mexico after, I mean, my, I ran out of money because I was living with my savings. I have one yuan in my pocket. And then one friend asked me, what's next? And I was saying, uh, I had to look for a job. I have no money. I'm broke. And then I, I went to start working soon. And by chance, this friend, she was working in this new startup from Silicon Valley. They were looking for someone in Latin America for doing business with a GPS application in the phones. Can you imagine that time? It was kind of like the early days of GPS. No ways, no Google Maps, no nothing. I mean, I mean, OpenStreetMap, I have no idea of that. So I started working with this company. And then I started getting to know about satellites, about the GPS, how it works, and then few years later about open mapping and then I discovered open street map I'm like what why people is mapping and and then if there are already maps like the question I received in so many workshops I gave all around so that's how I, I kind of started the journey in, in just special I mean by chance and I'm so happy to to be in this journey for already 11 years and I don't see myself anywhere else I mean I'm, I'm really happy continue learning regarding disaster management, regarding, I mean, how can we support challenges on Earth, I mean, with algorithms and their observations. So, so many things I think we can do with, with your spatial and uh, what we are doing in, in every single field we are, we are targeting now. So even I'm not so technical, I'm more in the partnership side. I am trying to put together companies doing like valuable that data that can work with algorithms and then we can solve challenges together. So that's kind of my role at this moment. Regarding uh, what I'm doing in you might think open street map is kind of a more like supporting how the, the organization can achieve the mission of mapping one billion people in the next five years. And I will be speaking about that in a talk tomorrow at one also uh, in one of the, the rooms. Uh, I would like I would like to add something. I would like to to add something very important. When I, I learned about OpenStreetMap in 2014 in Mali, uh, my country was facing a uh, um, lot of crisis, security crisis in the north. So there was no data, no OpenStreetMap data. So we. Um, uh, we learn to, 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 pro to produce data so we understand the data we will be making can, can help a lot a um, UFA, um, NGO and also um, people who, who make decisions and we understand that those data will be very very helpful for our country to, to, to address the many crises. So that's why we are, we are here. We are here and uh, yeah, we are very, very um, happy and proud to contribute to the uh, stabilization, to the, past, uh, to the, yeah, to the um, development of our country. Thank you.
Indeed, uh, data is very important, and you both had a tremendous journey on going uh, into geospatial, and especially when it comes to uh, getting in the early stages of geospatial. Uh, maybe we can hear about that a little bit more from uh, Maria, and um, because she <laughs> she already uh, gave us a little bit of, of a flavor of that. Okay, so um, speaking about uh, data, yes, I believe this is something that uh, I was interested in since the beginning, as a matter of fact. But I want to add something to what Natalia was saying, because in principle we are speaking about maps. And if you think about maps, the maps were before made for military purposes. That, that was the main purpose of making maps. And what is very relevant is that on the opposite, people now has the, have the maps. And this is the, the big point, in my opinion, the, the big difference with respect to the past, because having the map means controlling the territory, means monitoring the territory. And therefore, it is very important what Natalie is saying, was saying that they realized that they needed the data of their country. And I believe that a solution like OpenStreetMap, so open data, is the best solution for every of us. And uh, so this is my, my position with respect to data, but uh, I want to add something more because we have to do the same also with respect to software, as a matter of fact. So there is no reason of keeping secret the software we are developing because we, there are so many problems in the world. We have so many challenges. Why to repeat different people the same procedure, developing the same piece of code, when on the opposite we can collaborate for creating something where we can live better all together? And so now I leave the word to some, somebody else who wanted to go ahead with this point. Um go to uh, expanding on what you're saying about data and, um, and everything else. I'm going to go to um, Danielle uh, because she's doing some outreach or she has done some outreach and um, I think her experience in geospatial is also interesting. Thank you, Christina. I like the visualization of the data. I think that's so important, especially in communication and outreach. Um, especially with climate change, it's a very complex thing to understand. And environmental science is a very complex thing to understand. But I think these geospatial maps really help people better understand and visualize. And it's, it's basically science storytelling. What I really like to say is you're telling a story through this visualization, through this map or through this, and really helping people understand the science better. Exactly, and there are many, many um, touching on the open data and open software and so on. Um, we have here a panel of women, we're in women in geospatial, so we obviously want to change the status quo and uh, go from panels to uh, women only panels or like women balanced panels um, and so on. So my next question is basically uh, based on some statistics that we got from the Phosphor-G uh, registration. Um, only 20% of the registered uh, attendees of Phosphor-G um, have answered uh, that they are women. That's a very worrisome statistic. Now, uh, I have to add that um, this is based on whoever answered. But um, scaled uh, the number of uh, attendees, this is still worrisome. And we've seen this as uh, a statistic over geospatial in general. So I wanted to, to know what got you, uh, well, what got you interested in open data, it's obvious uh, by now. But uh, what do you think about this phenomenon of women not going enough into um, open geospatial? Let's go with Maria. 
Yes, yes, I understand, Christina, your frustration, but please be positive. Because when I started working on geospatial information, I was the only woman there. So now it is 20%. It's, uh, it's a lot. It means that we did, we have been doing something. So it's, um, it is uh, from the uh, cultural point of view, um, the science and technology were not considered something for women. Uh, as women, we were supposed to do something else. I, I, don't, I don't mean only giving birth to ch uh, children, but uh, doing something else, so literature and all these stuff, music and so on. So this is uh, being so involved in science and technology, like the 20%, I know that is not enough, but it, is, it was a big change in a few years. And... I see the number of my female students increasing year by year. So don't be pessimistic because I believe that in a few years probably we will be the half, if no more than the half, because women are very good in science and technology, in my opinion. So um, no, it's, it's not about 20%. <laughs> Well, we hope it's not 20%. It's, um, it's just the statistics we got for Phosphor Tea, obviously. But uh, we, we touched this topic on Monday, and we've seen a lot of uh, women dropping from geospatial in general, and uh, women dropping from open geospatial mostly. So um, I wanted to, to learn from Miriam or Natalie uh, if you had any of these uh, experiences while working with um, in open geospatial. Uh, uh, thank you, Christina. I have one question. This 20% is about the people who didn't refer to their pronouns or of the people who actually sign up for and register to post for you. So indeed, it's not 20% um, overall statistic. Um, so it's just the people that answered uh, about their pronouns. But uh, even so, um, in my talks with Maria and so on, we just realized that they're very, <laughs> the percentage of male to female, <laughs> it's uh, not very balanced in, uh, in Phosphor G yeah. itself. For me, it would be also interesting, I mean, to see, I mean, if you have the normal questions, female, male, uh, not answer or on non-binary, I think that's kind of the, 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 the other type of question that I receive a lot. It would be interesting to see how many people, they, they answer this type of question, and how many people still, they are not familiar about the pronouns. Because I feel that there is many people, including in me, it took me a while to understand I mean, how, how it works, uh, the pronoun part. So I wonder is because the lack of understanding about how the pronouns work or they are not familiar with this or i mean or they are used to this kind of question so just i mean leaving that in there because i also don't want to be pessimistic like, like maria i see i think we need to see the light at the end of the tunnel and i, I hope there are more than 20 percent uh at least in my company i mean uh, i was able to to get the support from the from the management and we are 18 people watching uh, post for ye i haven't i don't know how many we are women but maybe i mean i would say maybe 35 percent we, we are women so i'm happy to, to share that with you guys so from my side i i, I don't i i also agree with maria regarding when i start giving like talks uh when i start getting like really involved and fell in love with open street map and i realized the first time i saw the data from my home country mexico and latin america comparing to europe and other places and i was like wait these guys in Germany, they are already mapping the trash bins. And we don't have streets in Mexico? Come on, guys. This is not possible. So that was kind of the joke I was making in every single workshop I was giving because it was true. I mean, you see Mexico with lack of data, not even streets in, in medium-sized cities or like important towns. And then you were having all these things already here in Europe already, already mapped. So it, that was back in 2014, at the time also Natalie uh, joined Open Street Map. It happens also to me to this kind of discovery. So at that time I started giving workshops and also with some other people in Mexico, Latin America. And then I saw the balance as Maria was saying that it was really hard to see in the conferences. It was really hard to see in the workshops, uh, female presence. So. We, we start thinking about how to promote the promote, and that's how also, also Yuhika got started in a certain point. 
But I think now when I go to conferences and, and I see also, I mean, there is thing, of course, I mean, like, I mean, not a, a balance that they want, the, the balance we want to see, but at the same time, I see how things are moving. Of course, not in the time and the pace we would like to see them. I mean, we, we would like to see them faster because, I mean, the ones that we are involved as Maria Brovelli, as Maria Arias, you, Christina, you, Alina, you, Natalie, I mean, we make a lot of noise. But there is still a lot to be done to be able to bring and keep more women interested in, in, the, in the mother, more interested in what possibilities they have for their careers and for some other things within your special. So I think uh, we still need to be a lot of... Uh, so people sometimes they don't know how to approach how uh, the, 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 the special world. They don't know how to, to do certain things. So I think as long as we continue what we are doing right now uh, regarding mentorship, regarding having maybe one-to-ones with people saying, hey, I mean, what, what do you like? I mean, how do you see yourself in maybe three, five years? Why you don't submit this talk? I have been supporting so many, so many women regarding checking abstracts uh, or sending links about events that they can participate because the first conference, it will be like, oof, I don't, I'm not capable. Oof, I don't have nothing to speak about. And then it becomes an addiction. You want to keep speaking about what you're passionate about in one, in two, in five conferences and more. So I think when we switch this to more and more women, I mean, then we spread the word and then we're going to be continuing to see more, more presence in, in open your special, in your special and in general. So I think it's an ongoing process. I mean, and of course, I mean, things are changing, not, as I mentioned, I mean, not how we would like to see them in the short term, but we, we cannot, I mean, keep us quiet or, or in silence. I mean, this is something, I mean, we should keep working together. Exactly. Empowering women is something that is really important and giving them, um, we have so many programs of mentorship right now, and it's really important to make this noise about them and let people know that there um, there are there. Um, they can access them, they can go and ask for help if they need it. Uh, it's also important to not only just mentor as a technical or a skill level uh, mentorship, but it's also important to have um, at least a chat with somebody. And sometimes it's really, really useful to unload. And um, I'm looking at the discussion that is going on Venulus as well. And we have, um, we have uh, some comments about uh, women being burned out. Um, and this being one of the reasons why uh, they are living uh, STEM and um, why this imbalance between us and uh, our male counterparts happens. And um, sometimes it's really good to at least have somebody to unload or um, somebody to encourage you in the, in, the, in the process. I would like to learn a little bit from Daniel um, because I know that you, since you've been working on uh, on uh, this outreach phase, um, what have you? What's your experience? What have you seen? So, I am of the opinion that twenty percent is is way too low. Um, I think that we definitely need more mentorship. We also need to see a lot more female role models. We need to see a lot more professors at the university level, women. And we need to see a lot more female teachers from you know K through 12 in the in the US system. Um, we I think it's really important that women are out there speaking about science on TV, uh, you know, on shows just encouraging women to pursue a STEM field. I think it's really important to have a community, a network, and uh, especially at the university level, I've I've read about some studies that women drop out of PhD programs or they don't pursue academia because they maybe had a male um, professor or PhD advisor and they just see how the system is just, you know, majority is male. So I see a lot. I see one of my goals as in communication and outreach is to say, hey, you can do any kind of science you want, any kind of STEM field. So that's why I like doing a lot of the community outreach so women can can see that because I've had female role models that I see on TV or I have read about. So um, that encourages me. So I hope to encourage and inspire other women. 
Um, I really, I would like to add something to, to what you just said. Um, there was a recent documentary that I encourage everybody to follow. Uh, it's called Picture a Scientist. And uh, it's about um, the different stories of, uh, I think, four women, if I remember well, um, about the way that they they entered the field of geospatial um, at different levels and how they have uh, navigated this journey, what was their experience and uh, how the fight for us to, to get um, to get to a balanced level uh, started. It's really important, as you said, to have uh, mentors, uh, to have um, people stepping uh, up and trying to help the others and also have role models, uh, people that we can look at and um, learn from them. And sometimes it's even good to see them as I want to be there. And uh, it, it's nice to, to to have more women in this position. So I'll let, let Natalie also uh, give us her thoughts about um, how it is to, to go into open geospatial and how it is to um, to be a woman in this field and what what, uh, what prevents more participation. Yeah, um, first uh, I would like to say that uh, I do agree with Maria uh, and Miriam, so we, we let's be optimistic because we are doing a lot of things to get involved more women in this field. Uh, in, in Mali um, and in West Afri Africa in particular, it's, uh, it's difficult to be, uh, to be um, a woman in geospatial or even a woman in public life. So we, we have a lot of challenges here because uh, um, we are facing religious, culture, belief, uh, which, um, yeah, which can, uh, um, which are uh, obstacles for, for women to, to progress, to, to be a leader and to, to be involved in public life. But uh, we, we, we are doing our best and also the government is uh, doing his best because we, we are currently a, a minister a minister who are promoting women uh, women empowerment. Uh, so in, in our level in open map field it's difficult for me and uh, but um, I, I got every time support from everyone whenever I'm facing difficulties, whenever, uh, yeah, whenever I'm facing a uh, technical difficulties or yeah, anything. So it's not easy, but uh, yeah, I'm here and I'm very um, decided to, to go ahead yeah. and also to get a lot of women involved in, in, in geospatial. Uh, we three, three months ago we, we, we initiated a, a program to, to train women yeah to, to learn to train them to, to map their own challenges. I think this is, this is a, a best way to, to, to get involved more women to learn them to, to map their own challenges. So that's what we are, we are, we are doing currently. Yeah, and I think uh, this can be also, uh, yeah, we can we can try to do same thing in other country. Yeah, to 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 learn women to yeah to to map their their own challenges. Yeah. Um, thank you, Natalie. Uh, based on what we discussed so far, um, I see that we have a question in uh, in the ch uh, chat uh, regarding what was the most important thing, mentor, opportunity, meeting somebody, um, jumping to uh, a, a job uh, that helped your career in geospatial. Uh, just if we can single out one, one little thing. Um, Okay, it's the Can you come? Oh, no, nothing. Please, can you come on again, Christina? 
uh, if uh, you can single out one thing that uh, helped your career significantly, um, a mentor or opportunity, uh, um, yeah, uh, I think um, the, the man, it is uh, the mentorship because um, we, um, yeah, I, I've been, uh, um, I've been trained by. Um, um, what we call the uh, project uh, uh, open street map francophone. This is a, a, a program who train us and who uh, who were here to, to train also OSM open street map community in West Africa. So we uh, yeah. So um, I was uh, personally be. Uh, supported by this this uh, this program yeah since the beginning till now so i learned a lot of things from from this program yeah so i can say it is a mentor mentorship is uh, the best way yeah we're gonna take mentorship on one of the i don't know if i if, uh, if uh, this is the, the the best answer of your question but it is, it is, and we're gonna take this as a key word for uh, for this session. I'm gonna let Maria um, also uh, tell us what's her. Yes, uh, I try to be very short anyway. Um, the point is that, uh, as I told you, I started uh, very early with the geospatial, open geospatial information. And in 2000, I organized the first conference in Italy, not about open source GIS, because at that time there was only GRASS. So it was the uh, first user conference of GRASS in Italy. And uh, then we have this first meeting uh, attended by 50 people, around 50 people. And I was surprised because I don't felt anymore alone. I said, oh, there are other people in Italy who are interested in grass. And that's wonderful. And so we decided to organize uh, in 2002 what we called the first international meeting of grass. Then we discovered that it was not the first, really. There was, there was another one also in US, but we simply didn't know because the, the connection at that time were not as they are today. And so we organized this first conference, international conference, and I, I remember that um, it was attended by people like uh, Venka, Venka Tesha Gavan, and Marcus Netteler and Elena Mitashova. So for the first time, I saw these people uh, who were not Italian and they were working with grass. So that was surprising. We are not alone. Oh, come on, there are other people like me around. And this was uh, uh, very positively surprising and giving to me, but also to the other Italian people, a lot of energy, like saying, come on, we can go ahead because we can build something from that. We are not alone. It's something that is uh, spread all over the world. So we are very, uh, very, very strong and we must go ahead. This was the beginning. This was the beginning and was probably the most uh, important event uh, uh, with respect to geospatial information in my life. That's a wonderful experience. Um, we also had on Monday Veronica Andreo. She also um, talked about her experience with grass and how she got into geospatial. It was really, uh, really kind of the same. And um, the, the interesting fact is that you both pointed something. Uh, we are not alone and we are strong together. So that's uh, something that we, um, we're we going to take as a second <laughs> or um, on par with uh, mentorship from this session. I'm going to let um, Daniel as, uh, as well to, um, <laughs> to, see, to see which is her. Um, yeah, I actually got my current job from um, a mentorship or a, an informal friendship, you know, kind of thing. Um, about two years ago, I presented at a science team meeting and my current boss was so impressed with what I did and how I presented and 
everything, like how quick I was thinking on my feet, that kind of thing that um, about a year and a half later, she offered me a job. So that just goes to show that I think it's important to volunteer to go speak at conferences or, or put yourself out there because it's just all part of that networking and you just start meeting other women and clicking with them and sharing experiences. And in that case, with my boss, we just clicked over, you know, being women in a, in a male dominated field. So that was really important and just led to my current job. Yeah, I would like to, to say that networking is definitely something beneficial and um, I encourage every every single uh, woman out there to, to go um, to try to push themselves a little bit and get, get out of the comfort zone and try to network a little bit more or get involved. Um, first steps are never easy for anybody. <laughs> Uh, nobody's uh, perfect, so it's important to not be afraid to make mistakes and put yourself out there. I'm going to let Miriam as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so one point, I mean, I think I have different points that also make me like become more and more passionate. But I mean, two that I can remember right now is uh, when I realized, I mean, when I was mentioning before that Mexico was like so poor in data, I was thinking, uh, as Maria said, I mean, I mean, I feel so lonely. I mean, now, now what? So how can I organize with more people interested in the topic? So I went to this uh, hack space in Mexico City, Rancho Electronico, and because they have some mapping gatherings every every week. Then uh, I went there, and then they were doing some mapping workshops, and then we started speaking about how we can do things together. And then suddenly, I mean, we start giving workshops for universities and also even for governments that they didn't know anything about uh, open data or open street maps. So that was super uh, interesting. And then I remember that, I mean, now in Corona times, it feels like crazy, right? We did this workshop in the one we had 88 students. So we were like, I mean, how come there are so many people like uh, participating in this workshop? Uh, so the, the trainers, we were like, I mean, I tell you, more than happy about participating, about doing all this uh, presential workshop and also showing applications and how we were doing things. So that was also for me, like, we need to do more workshop. We need to keep spreading the work, like kind of a, a evangelization of these open data solutions. And then also one thing that also, again, gives me that thing, feeling about, what else I mean can, can be done? Uh, set of the map. The set of the map, the first one I attended and also I gave a conference was the one in New York City in the United Nations, and that felt good. That felt so good. <laughs> so being there in the one, I mean, you have seen so many times in movies or in, in actual UN conferences and being there speaking about data and about maps. So that was also really, really like uh, an experience that I can never forget. Indeed, getting involved in all these um, initiatives, all these, uh, even going to your local group and, uh, I don't know, just doing something with them, it's uh, really beneficial. And um, I'm looking at the questions, and actually we have two questions related to this. Uh, how do, do you get involved in the geospatial uh, sector as a career, um, a progression route, a graduate scheme, apprenticeship? Uh, I think you already answered some of these questions. Just go there um, and get involved in your group. Um, or like, uh, I don't know, pat somebody on the back <laughs> and say, oh, I want to get involved in this um, when you network. Um, but I would like to learn from Maria because I know that you have very, very limited time uh, right now. Uh, so Maria uh, will uh, have to leave us in about four minutes. Um, I want to, to hear uh, from you, um, how would you get involved your students in geospatial um, more than just the university course? And what key personal, uh, personality trait they should have to be successful? Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you also, and sorry for, because I have to leave because I have classes. I, I have a class at 2.15 a.m to run to the classroom because it's not close to my office. And um, yeah, with respect to students, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have to tell you that uh, I'm a very severe professor. So I want them to study a lot because it's something, um, yeah, it's not uh, so, um, 
uh, studying is something important and we, we must uh, we must study because we must be better than the other people <laughs> this is my starting point uh, but uh, besides that it's really important also to transmit them the importance of what they are doing what is the reason why they are doing that what is the reason for becoming a good map makers a good gis expert uh, and so generally what i tend to do is to propose them some projects uh, which are which have some social or environmental content because i believe that science is uh, science and tech is really science and tech when it is science and tech for good. I'm not interested in the other science and tech, as a matter of fact. And this is what I want to transmit also uh, to my students. And then the other point, in my opinion, which is very relevant, is to uh, teach the student how to collaborate together. Because I believe that uh, all of us, we have different abilities. And uh, if we want to solve the problems that we are facing, uh, we have to do together. So I really believe that leave no one and no place behind. It is not just uh, a set of words, but it's something that has to guide our life also when we are dealing with the geospatial information. So this is what I'm trying to teach to my students, which is beyond obviously the geospatial information, but I believe that is important all the same. And I, I like when uh, I see that uh, they feel the same like me with respect to that. Then I accept all students because we, all of us, we are diverse obviously, but uh, I see that my favor is <laughs> for these people feeling in this way. So I don't know if you I answered completely your question because it's very it's a very complicated and long one, but at least I gave a starting uh, point of view. Thank you, Maria. I think that's uh, that's something that answers the question, and uh, whoever is attending this session is going to uh, to get um, a good answer on how to proceed in geospatial. Um, I'm thanking you for being with us today. I know you have class, so um, I'm going to yes. continue though the panel Sorry. with uh, the other lady. Big kiss Thank you so to much. All of you. Ciao. 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 It was nice having Ciao. you. Yeah. So we're going to continue the panel and I'm going to go over to Daniel to actually um, expand on what uh, Maria said. Yeah, I think that it's important for people to be proactive in setting up their career. So some of my suggestions would be to get involved are to create your own website, create your own Twitter account related to geospatial stuff. Start networking on social media with people who you admire. Start looking at their projects and just, you know, emailing them, slacking them, whatever, saying, oh, I, I was interested in this. And, you know, do you have any internships or, you know, just start asking questions, just putting yourself out there. And uh, I found that the more you you speak at conferences, the more active you are online, the more opportunities will come to you. So that's kind of my advice for getting involved. Uh, and I would like to hear from Miriam because she's very active <laughs> as well in this. Yeah, thank you, Christina. So as I mentioned, I mean, I didn't study your special as my major. I mean, life took me to your special. And at the beginning, when I start this special journey, I mean, I, I, I had two computers. One computer with the, the meetings and some other things, little computing. OK, what they said, and then taking note, and then looking, then uh, what's that, what that means. I mean, what means uh, one word that I hear that I never heard before. So all these terms in your special that people won't know unless you study a major in your special. So I, I don't I don't remember I mean which words but I mean for sure I mean there were tons of words that I didn't know so I have to look for definitions and then see diagrams about how things work so for me that was something also that led me to start managing technical teams even without having the special background but then at a certain point I decided that also I really want to go like a bit deeper so I decided to go 
to school again uh, after a few years of not being in school. And then I went to study uh, geomatics. Uh, I studied one year of geomatics in the UNAM in Mexico City. And that was also really cool because I got I got more involved, I mean, using tools and play with different things. So I think if, if you're interested, I mean, you will start looking for things that learning by yourself and also now there's so much material online. There is, I mean, you can spend three lives watching uh, tutorials from YouTube, I will say, and still, I mean, there will be some pending for the next lives. So I, I think that's something really, really, it's a nice problem to have today. I mean, that we didn't have in fact because there were not enough tools. So also within your special, there are so many different things, so many different uh, lines of action. So I would say that what is people passionate about? They should like check, I mean, who is, uh, as Daniel said, who is doing certain things, uh, maybe look more information in that topic, maybe taking some MOOCs, maybe taking some classes, some other things. So you get more involved in, in, in those. For me, doing the volunteer work, has been opening so many doors everywhere. I mean, you, you cannot imagine. Uh, and without this volunteer work, that of course, I mean, sometimes can be tiring, sometimes can be exhausting. Sometimes you are like, should I rather be having a beer with my other friends who doesn't have nothing special more than writing this paper? But I mean, you have to find a balance in the ones you're happy with both things. So with your non-special life and also with the special life that you're living because that's awesome at the same time. So I think, People should find their, their own paths. In my case, because I didn't study, I have to like dig further and further for, for finding, I mean, what I what I like the most. But I think right now it's, it's really easy. I mean, as I said, following people, checking online, I mean, what you like the most. And don't be afraid about asking people how they can participate with you in certain projects. So if you don't, don't have this fear about asking, what can be worse? They would say no, but maybe they would say yes. So just go for it and, and ask. That's the thing. That's a very good advice to go for it. And uh, it came from both you and Daniel, just um, to, to put yourself uh, in a position in which you uh, try to make the connection with other people. And um, I don't want to underestimate. <laughs> I mean, um, Maria is not here anymore, but uh, it's not that point. Um, the idea is that you you have some formal education that obviously you need to follow, um, and uh, there is this uh, thing in which you you need to batter other people. Uh, you need to learn. You need to make yourself a professional in the technical point of view. Or when I say technical, I'm not referring necessarily to the technical skills, but uh, professional point of view. Uh, but you also need to um, to consider the fact that you have an uh, alternate path that helps you get in this career in geospatial. And uh, I would like to to hear Natalie's thoughts as well uh, about this. I think you're muted, Natalie. I can just mute you. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, from, yeah. From from my side, um, yeah. Um, what? Uh, why I'm 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 involved in this uh, in geospatial world? As I said in the beginning. I, I really the, the need the need to to produce data because uh, my country is facing lot of problem lot of crisis and I understand that the geospatial data is the um, I think you muted yourself, Natalie. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, I said why I'm, I'm here, why I'm, I'm involved in OpenStreetMap in geospatial uh, work. Uh, because I, I realized uh, since the beginning that uh, being involved here is the best way for me to, to help, to support uh, my country to, to solve a uh, lot of problem is facing a lot of problem my community are facing uh, yeah i'm also uh, trying to get 
other people um, in this in this field so we can together uh, achieve uh, our good so we um, today we have uh, uh, we were able to, to set up for example two youth matter chapter with in two universities yeah which also are very active which are doing their their uh, who are uh, training other students in universities level and also uh, we were also able to to set up a framework of exchange including government agencies including um, public and private enterprises to talk together uh, about geospatial data and uh, how they can work together to share data yeah for solving um, our problems here I'm muted. <laughs> so um, I wanted to say that's a very good take out. Uh, the fact that you we heard about mentorship, or we heard about coming together. Um, uh, we heard about um, the fact that you have to expose yourself and go out there and look for opportunities. Um, as you said, you have not, uh, as Miriam said, um, you don't have to be afraid of uh, reaching out to people and these are all um, also collaboration uh, these are things that put forward a geospatial career um, i would like to before concluding i have another question and i think it's um a, an important one to to answer now in the panel but we're also going to go into uh, a discussion afterwards uh, with everybody that's on the venueless uh, session and wants to join us for networking afterwards. So my question is, um, what point of your career you felt really down, um, or you you had this um, this moment in which you didn't think you were going to to survive geospatial, let's say, and what made you go over it? Um, maybe we can start with Daniel. <laughs> this is, it is really tough. I had a couple times in my career, but I'd say that the, when I was getting my PhD and it was like year five and I was just not being able to work on my ideas or just, um, everything was kind of being dictated to me and I, I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit my PhD. Um, you know, I had all male committee members. Um, I just felt kind of like beaten down. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't, you know, didn't feel worthy. It was a whole imposter syndrome and everything like that. Um, but I got over it mainly with the support of my family and friends and knowing that it would, it would help my career in the end that I needed to get my PhD and finish it, get that degree and that I could then go on. And I just had to remind myself why I started the PhD in the first place, my love of science, you know, solving climate change, making the world a better place. So I just had to kind of remind myself, but there was a good year there where I wanted to quit. So that, that was a challenge. Thank you, Daniel. I think every PhD student, myself included, uh, has this imposter <laughs> syndrome. Um, we all go through that, and it's really important to remind ourselves why we're we here. Um, the reason why I'm asking this question, maybe I didn't give you enough context, is because on Monday we had a very heartfelt <laughs> conversation about um, different um, different experiences that um, women had in geospatial. Uh, some of them overcome them, some of them couldn't. Um, and I think it's important to, to hear your thoughts and your experience. Um, maybe it's a good one, maybe it's not a good one. Um, but this is not a perfect field and it's not going to be a perfect career. But um, it's important to see that other people with stellar careers have uh, struggles as well. Um, so I'm going to go to Miriam as well. 
Yeah, thank you, Christina. So I think from my side, uh, when I have been volunteering in OpenStreetMap, of course, I mean, it's so many diverse backgrounds and, and the diverse minds, I mean, behind uh, this uh, initiative. So sometimes you think you're doing certain things in a good way for the benefit of the, of the global project, but maybe people, uh, they will see it in a different way. So for me, when uh, I was coordinating with my, with my team, uh, some data import that will be benefiting so much for adding uh, roads and municipalities and boundaries and so many things. I thought, wow, I mean, I mean, we're going to be saving so much time invested uh, in doing kind of a manual mapping. I mean, thanks to this. Uh, so for me, it was like a no brainer. It was like an awesome project. And then of course we have to present it to the community and do some uh, presentation regarding what was uh, happening. And also in case something fails, how we can revert it. So when I start seeing some uh, people saying that uh, we were trying to impose and we were trying to, uh, instead of building community, uh, doing things uh, that were not benefiting the map or the community, I was thinking, I mean, this is positive. I mean, I, I don't, I don't see how this is a negative way about adding data useful for everyone in this case. So. I think for me that was like like uh, in one point I was like really low in like trying to see I mean I mean how can they not see that this that is positive no so for me it was like like a like strong mo moment in the one say uh, should I continue with this because it's like exhausting it's mentally it's physically exhausting that that you find a kind of walls in 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 front of you uh, in the ones they don't let you go forward for doing things that you think are positive. And then if we think that maybe 100 mappers will be taking 20 years to add what can be added in a, in, a, in maybe two weeks of work, I mean, why we shouldn't go for it? Because I mean, if the goal is having the largest map of the world, I mean, and benefit people from it. I mean, so for me, that was like some starting moments in the ones I was not sure if I was the one wrong or what was happening there, I mean, and how, because also in the mapping world, I mean, there can be some harsh discussions in the ones they make you doubt about yourself or your capacity, about if you are doing things right, or if you are also kind of blind and you don't see the overall picture. So I think that was a strong moment for, for me. This is, uh, this is a very omnipresent, um a recurrent theme actually this imposter syndrome the the mm -hmm. fact that uh, you you get undermined by other people mm -hmm. uh, and as a woman you feel it a little bit more i uh, i would say and this is because um, this kind of feels like discrimination in a certain way um i think we had a question about this uh, regarding uh the role of failure as part of the process and i think uh, your answers um kind of answer this uh, partially answer this question um we could expand a little bit more if you want but let's hear from natalie as well and then we can get the discussion um yeah from my side i, I can say that uh, yes last year when i was to to lead uh, the open cities project in mali so i was very afraid because i i was wondering if i I will be able to to achieve the the goal of the, the project. So every time I have to lead a project, yeah, my first question is, uh, I might be able to <laughs> to achieve the the goal of this project. So I'm every every time I'm afraid about this, but uh, because I like also collaborate with other people, so I'm afraid. But I know that at the end. Uh, I will be able to do because I will be collaborating with other people who can support me, who can technically support me, who can help me, who can advise me every time. So yeah. <laughs> so what I can I can advise is collaborating whenever you are yeah whenever you are afraid or you you are not uh, sure to be able to do something yeah. To, the, the best way is to ask someone to help you yeah to. This is what I'm, I, I, I do every time. 
we actually have a question about that. Um, I would like to uh, keep the conversation going, but this is um, um, this is what we wanted to achieve for the panel. So at least uh, get these questions coming uh, and also um, have some starting points for for a discussion. Um, I'm going to keep an eye and collect all the questions from the venue list and I'm going to thank our panelists for actually uh, being here today and um, sharing all this information with us. Um, Alina, I think she um, she noted down some of the key uh, points of this discussion and we're going to let everybody know. Um, we uh, I just wanted to uh, tell everybody that we're gonna go for the next two hours into um, our work adventure environment. So um, if I can share my screen for a second, um, I wanted to show you what uh, this, um, oops, one second, <laughs> um, what Venulas is, oops, screen. And, um, so for the next uh, next hour, we're gonna go uh, into uh, Venulas. Um, we have their uh, work adventure map. If you're registered to FOS4G, you can access it uh, access it from the main panel. There's a women in social meeting there. You can customize your avatar and you can interact with us. Uh, we're going to meet in the purple room uh, of Work Adventure. So once you enter the, the venue, um, there's a straight purple room and that goes to a Jitsi meeting where we would like to keep the conversation rolling and actually interact a little bit more with our audience. Um, so if, you're, uh, if you want to keep discussing about um, what we can do about geospatial and how we can uh, expand our career and how we can learn from each other, please head to work adventure. Um, and just a, as a heads up, we're going to use uh, Slido as well. It's an interactive tool that you can use online. So if you go to uh, uh, slide.do, uh, uh, it's going to get you to that tool. And uh, we're going to share this code with you again uh, once we're in work adventure. Uh, so we can um, gather some uh, input from our audience. Um, I'm very sorry to cut this short, uh, but I am um, really thankful to Miriam, Daniel, uh, Natalie, and Maria as well for uh, honoring our um, honoring our uh, invitation and for answering all these uh, questions. Uh, I myself actually learned quite a few things um, from this session, so I'm very thankful to you, ladies. Uh, and I've seen that the, there was a very animated <laughs> discussion on Venulus as well. Um, and uh, I would like to actually um, go back there and uh, read some of the comments before uh, finishing, just to give you an... Uh, I don't know if you monitor that uh, as panelists, I don't, uh, but... Um, uh, the, the ladies there are very uh, were very uh, keen to share some thoughts. Uh, we got some greetings from ladies of Landsat, which is our twin um, sort of <laughs> community uh, that does amazing things for uh, remote sensing ladies, um, but not only remote sensing, uh, they, they get involved in getting women uh, voices elevated in many, many um, and bring many opportunities to them. Uh, we also um, got some uh, some comments on um, that see the actual um, community coming together and see that we can support each other um, and uh, that's uh, that's really encouraging for whoever feels down at these days. Uh, we also got some very <laughs> interesting comments about Miriam. I, I really <laughs> hope you <laughs> you're going to check them. Um, basically praising comments, Miriam. <laughs> so nothing, nothing bad. <laughs> um, Thank and you. we also have <laughs> a comment from Joe, which says that "Donde cabe una caben dos," which uh, means uh, for whoever doesn't speak Spanish, is that where um, where there's one, uh, when one fits, two fits. 
So um, I think uh, the most important thing is to, for us ladies to stick together and to learn from each other and to reach to one another uh, at the points in um, at which we feel mostly down or we need help. Um, as a closing remark, I would like to let each uh, each of you say uh, say something that you think um, you want your uh, the audience to uh, to to get uh, out of uh, of this session. Should I go? I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to encourage everyone to keep working hard. Um, you know, do the lean in, sit at the table, speak at the conferences, make your YouTube videos, um, just keep working hard at it. And just to know that you've got a, a community of women behind you supporting you and you can reach out at any time. Yeah, I'm, I'm from my side, I would like to say that having a more balanced world and also your special and open your special is not just a, a women thing. Uh, so we need more allies. We need more more people who can also join us. I mean, in more more vocal in raising their hands. And, and I say that always this when, when I try to participate is it's like uh, how all these uh, people who has been in the industry for a long time and they don't belong to these minority groups or these underrepresented groups. How can also they they be supportive and also they can raise their voice, their hands to say, where are the women? Where are the the minority groups? So that's also super important. Uh, that is not only our our job; it's everybody's job to to do to make it happen. Thank you, Miriam. Natalie. Yeah, first I would like to, to thank you, Christina, and to thank uh, all those great la ladies. Uh, yeah, it was an honor for me to, to take part to these panels. Uh, what I can say is to let's, let's work together, let's work together to promote women involvement in geospatial, uh, in particular, and in tech in general, and in science. So let's work together to build a better world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Natalie, as well. And uh, thank you for participating to this panel, uh, for sharing your uh, experience and everything. Um, and um, don't forget that we're heading over work adventure to talk a little bit more. So I'm um, I'm really waiting for you. The, the link is no login required. Um, so, if you want to participate, you're welcome. See you there. See you there. Bye. See you there. Bye bye.